Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Teju, and I am on our product marketing team at Opta. And in today's presentation, we're going to cover moving beyond passwords with Opta, how to balance both security and usability. So before we go into the presentation, just a quick uh, intro on myself. Again, my name is Teju. I'm on our product marketing team here at Opta, um, and my focus is across our security products. So anything that relates to multi-factor authentication, adaptive policies, password list, device-based security is my focus area. Um, I've been at Okta for about three and a half years. And then prior to that, I was at Microsoft um, helping customers implement identity and device-based solutions. So with that, we can go ahead and get started. Before I jump into the details on you know, password lists and moving beyond passwords with Okta, just want to level set for those of you who are not maybe not very familiar with Okta itself. Um, we're an identity and access management company focusing on managing uh, access for workforce uh, identity as well as customer identity. So when you think about the different types of users that are accessing your resources, employees, partners, customers, consumers, we help to set up authentication policies for all of those groups and help to do that in the most secure way possible. So when I talk about passwordless authentication today, you can, you can think of it from a perspective of enabling passwordless authentication for both your workforce as well as your customers and consumers. So before we any, go any further, let's take a look at the history of passwords. Um, we know that there's a long origin of when passwords originated. We go from watch, watch words to challenge response to the more um, today definition of passwords, which is basically providing some form of authentication after providing the username. But of course, we know that there's a variety of issues with how passwords are used today, including people sharing passwords amongst each other, um, using the same password for both corporate and personal applications, using very easy to guess passwords. And that's why we want to take a look at moving beyond passwords to more secure methods of authentication. We, so of course we know that passwords are no longer good enough. In fact, most of the breaches that we see, uh, the hacking related br breaches that we see are due to compromised or lost credentials. So again, it's no surprise that it's time to really move away from those passwords. Now this is through, true across three different categories. The first one is that we want to avoid credential sharing and breaches and um, decrease the probability of account takeover. So again, that's better accomplished when there's no password involved at all. The second is that using passwords uh, leads to increased user friction. And even though passwords are familiar for us, the reason that we really see increased friction is because password complexity requirements become more and more complex over time. So of course, organizations are trying to prevent a breach and account takeover. So that leads us to create password complexity requirements like the crazy ones you see, 15 characters like uppercase, lowercase, special characters, et cetera. Those obviously become hard for people to remember, cause us to um, write them down, leave them our passwords lying around, which of course ultimately just leads to breach anyways. And then lastly, there's also a cost associated with passwords, right? So think about those complex passwords, users needing to reset their password that, re that increases your um, help desk requests. So when we think about IT and even help desk for consumer applications, always having to reset your password really increases those costs. So we want to look at methods to help decrease costs and decrease user friction, but put, still provide the same level of security that you get um, when using a strong authentication factor. So that takes us to the current evaluation of the different authentications that we have, uh, authentication methods that we have. So we know that passwords are insecure and also deliver a poor user experience. But of course, like I said, passwords are something we're all very familiar with. So they're kind of an average uh, way to log in today. So then to solve the shortcomings of passwords, we came up with second factor authentication. Many of you are already familiar with second factor authentication or MFA today. Um, even if you don't use it in your day-to-day -day work, you've probably seen it in consumer applications as well. Like you log into maybe a banking app or log into Facebook. Many times when you log in from a new device, they'll ask you to verify your identity using like an SMS, for example. So this is more secure for sure, but it also delivers a poor user experience and also frequently requires that you have a phone or some type of additional hardware device. And then more recently, 
We've explored biometric authentication with things like face ID and touch ID. Those are both FIDO capable factors that offer a strong level of assurance as well as a better user experience. Um, so many times these type of authenticators do require specialized hardware. So that's something to think about. But overall, biometrics and FIDO authenticators can definitely provide the best end user experience uh, with the correct level of security that most organizations desire. So our hope is that ultimately our organizations can get to the point where they're able to deliver passwordless authentication through these FIDO capable biometrics. So as we go through our passwordless journey and implement, uh, implementation of passwordless, we want to think through the pros and cons with the current authentication methods and also think through what is the ideal authentication experience, right? So of course, we have to have an exceptional end user experience. We need to have security protections against phishing. We need to provide admins with controls and visibility to detect when something goes wrong. And of course, we need to choose a solution that scales as your organization grows and offer a great uh, TCO so that your support team is not inundated with various requests. So this is where we think passwordless authentication can help solve some of the challenges and then also deliver on the promise of a better end user experience. So with that, we wanna take a look at designing what your passwordless experience could actually look like. Now, when we take a look at passwordless authentication, we also wanna take a look at contextual access management and how that passwordless experience should actually be delivered. So generally speaking, when we, when we look at identity and access management tools, we take the application context and the user context, which essentially means what, what applications a user has access to, and then pair that with the different layers of um, context on top of it. So network context, like whether the user is logging in from a known IP address or logging in from a proxy. Device context, like whether or not the service has seen the device before. Um, and we, when we're talking about workforce use cases, whether or not the device is managed by an endpoint management tool. And then location context, that takes into thing like, things like new geolocations that users may be logging in from or imp impossible travel scenarios like I log in from San Francisco at 9 a.m. Pacific time, and then we see a login again on my same account um, from a risky country at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time, that's unlikely. So again, making access decisions based on that. So what we wanna do is take all of this context that we have and provide the best contextual response. So that could be the basics like allow and deny access and prompt for MFA, which is what we see many um, organizations do today. But of course, we want to move towards passwordless authentication. So with all the context that you see here, we can really help to drive towards passwordless. So some thoughts before you actually go passwordless. Let's say you're considering your passwordless journey for your organization, maybe for all users or just a subset of users to begin with. You want to look at four key areas before you decide what your journey is going to be. The first one is to really understand the nature of the security threats in the environment. What are you actually trying to protect against with going passwordless? Um, is that something that you're able to do with starting out uh, by building out an MFA deployment and then slowly moving towards passwordless? The second one is to understand the technology in play in order for you to actually get to the point of passwordless authentication. You want to understand how your users access your service what devices they use to access, and what is the level of assurance required for your business. The reason that you want to do that is that, like I said before, with different types of password lists, there's going to be different hardware requirements. For example, if you want to use biometrics, you probably need a newer type of device. Maybe you're okay with using uh, doing password lists with like a security key, like YubiKey, for example. And so you need to purchase that type of hardware for your users. The next thing is that you want to map out user groups and understand the user journey for each group. So how are users actually registering to your service or how are they um, activating their account on your service? Um, any recovery scenarios? We also want to map out the user experience and understand how the, how the impact of each technology is going to reduce user friction during authentication. And then of course, we need to map out the cost of deploying passwordless and the different technologies associated with it. So there's different options for passwordless, which I'll talk about in the upcoming slides. Um, you know, you can use security tokens. We see um, email magic links becoming more popular for consumer use cases. 
And then of course we have the FIDO um, two authenticator types that we see on newer hardware um, devices, but all of these offer different levels of assurance. So we wanna figure out what makes the most sense for your business in terms of cost um, paired with security assurance. So that takes us to the topic of passwordless with Okta and the different capabilities and options that you have with passwordless authentication um, when using Okta as your access management provider. So these are the, the four capabilities that I wanted to cover that are really the, the most compelling in terms of passwordless authentication in Okta. So we'll go through email magic link, factory sequencing, web authen, and then a new feature that I'm excited about that's coming soon called Okta FastPass. I'll go through what each of these are and some of the pros and cons with um, these methods. So starting with the first one, email magic link. With this um, password list mechanism, what, what you're really doing is allowing users to log into your application by sending them a link to your email. Now, like I said before, this one is a little bit more common for consumer applications. Um, but it, for example, if you have logged into Slack recently, you may have noticed that it asks you for your email. When you go to your inbox, you click on a link. Clicking on that link basically takes you back into the Slack application. So at a high level, that's how email magic links function. Now, the, the pros for email magic link is that, of course, it's easy to use. End user experience is um, very, very uh, simple and easy. The cons of email magic link are that you're basically dependent on the security of the user's email, actual email inbox. So let's say um, the user maybe doesn't have multi-factor authentication enabled on their email inbox. It is possible that a threat actor could then click on the link and access the app themselves. So there's different things that you need to think about um, when enabling email magic link and email based authentication for users. But this could be an option if your users don't have a FIDO capable device. So it could be essentially a backup um, authentication option. Now the next one, this is a capability specific to Okta called factor sequencing. Um, and the purpose of factor sequencing is to take steps um, towards authentication where you can forgo the need for a password. And the way that it works is that you want it, you're going to combine different layers of context and pair those with the appropriate factors that are uh, required. So for example, when we take a look at the UI here, let's say you have, um, we have, you have the behavior detection capability enabled. What we can say is, okay, if a login is coming from a new device or a new location or a new IP address, then we require a stronger factor type like Okta Verify Push, which is our uh, mobile authenticator app that supports biometrics. But then in scenarios where you have, um, you know, the login is not coming from a new device, it's coming from a known device that Okta has seen before, a known network that Okta has seen before, you might be okay with a less secure factor here, like, uh, like I mentioned, the email factor or SMS OTP. So the purpose of factor sequencing is to combine the context that Okta gives you with the appropriate factor type. So essentially you're making access decisions based on the risk that's associated with that end user's login. So this is a capability that's available in the product today. Um, and then we move towards WebAuthn and FIDO 2.0, which is really the focus area and interesting portion for when we talk about biometric authentication, really the new standard for biometrics and the only phishing proof factor on the market today. So you, we do have WebAuthn based authentication available in Okta today. Um, that's a great way also to forego the need for a password. What you can say is, okay, regardless of the risk level associated with the login, regardless of whatever context I have, the user has to provide a WebAuthn capable factor. So that's an option. Or you could say, you know, on high risk logins, I require WebAuthn because I know, and I have a high level of assurance that, that the user is who they say they are if they're going to use a WebAuthn or FIDO2 compatible factor. Uh, so again, this is, this is a capability that is available in the product today. You'll notice as you start you know, playing around with WebAuthn and FIDO2 that there are some dependencies on specific browsers and hardware types that actually support FIDO. But the great thing is that most mainstream devices and browsers do support it today. So when you think about um, like Windows Hello, for example, the Touch ID on Mac devices, um, Android Face Unlock and Fingerprint, and then more recently on iOS, both Face ID and Touch ID, those are all FIDO2 compatible factors. 
So because many of us are using those devices already, it's a great way to start moving towards the direction of passwordless or at least using FIDO2 as a method of um, second factor or multi-factor authentication. And then the last capability that I wanted to cover that's specific to Okta is Okta FastPass. So you can think of Okta FastPass as um, passwordless authentication into any app that's uh, secured by Okta. Now, the way that it works is that a user is going to register their device to Okta's directory. And then from there, they have passwordless authentication to anything that's connected to our service. So on the desktop side, that could be um, access from a browser or a desktop thick client. On the mobile side, it could be a native mobile application or mobile browser. But essentially, once your device has been registered, you won't be prompted for any additional credentials when logging into apps that are behind Okta. So this is great when you think about day-to-day -day login experiences, more so on the workforce side of things. Um, you know, you don't want to be continuously prompted for a password or prompted for MFA. So Okta FastPass is a great way to do that. Now, the other, the other component of FastPass is the security piece of it. When you get your device registered to Okta, what we're doing is creating a record that's actually bound to the TPM on the device or the secure, um, secure enclave on the device. And so that is also considered a phishing proof factor type, right? So what you could do is say, okay, any device that's registered to Okta, because I know that the registration is bound to the device, um, I'm okay with giving the user a passwordless login experience. So this is just another example of how you can utilize passwordless authentication um, in the product to best suit your business needs. So when we take a look at all of these um, passwordless options, email magic link, factor sequencing, WebAuthn, Okta FastPass, you can see how businesses are basically able to pick and choose the passwordless options that make the most sense for them, that help to meet security requirements, usability requirements, and then also give you a sense of what the cost of the different passwordless authentication options that are out there. So with that, I just wanna close it out by saying that if you are interested in taking a look at the different forms of passwordless authentication or just learning more about passwordless authentication in general, we have a couple of resources available on our website that you can take a look at some demos, videos, and, and data sheets. That'll give you a better sense of how you can pl plan your passwordless journey today and the different considerations that you need to take um, before you're able to deploy it throughout the organization or for, um, for consumer use cases for all of your customers and consumers. And with that, uh, we are ready to open it up for Q&A. Thank you.